Please join me for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, draw near to us once more. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And so the lectionary guides us this morning on the first Sunday of Lent to begin with a very familiar story from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. The story of Jesus being in the wilderness, in the desert, and tempted. Listen for God's word today. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Jesus ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only God. Then the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. But Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished every test, the devil departed from him until an opportune time. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So at the risk of being scandalous, I actually don't think the last verse I read is quite true. Luke 4, verse 13, it ends by saying, When the devil had finished every test, the devil departed from Jesus until an opportune time. I think Luke is taking a little bit of dramatic license here. He's having the devil tempt Jesus at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and then supposedly disappearing from the scene until the end. The end of the story when the devil entices Judas to betray Jesus and tries to tempt Jesus not to drink the cup of suffering that's been placed before him. I get what Luke is saying. But in truth, I think Jesus was tempted all the time. Jesus constantly faced temptations to do what was easy and expedient and comfortable and not to do what was necessary, just, and merciful. Temptations never left him alone. And I think there's a lot of evidence for this if you read through the Gospels. Early in Jesus' ministry, Jesus was praying by himself when his disciples came and interrupted him and said that everyone is looking for him. So in that moment, Jesus could have rejoined that crowd and built up his own mega ministry right there. But instead, he resisted that temptation and he told the disciples, no, we need to leave this place now that I may go and preach in other villages. Later, Jesus was speaking to this large crowd when it became clear that they hadn't eaten for quite a while. Now, Jesus could have then stood in front of them and said, you know, I'm going to take a break for a while. Go to the neighboring villages and find something to eat for yourselves. But instead, Jesus chose to feed them from a few loaves and fish. Another time, Jesus was on his way to the home of Jairus. Now, Jairus was the leader of the synagogue, a very important man, but his daughter was deathly ill. Jesus must have been tempted to put aside every other consideration and go in haste to this house to help the young girl. But instead, on that day, Jesus did stop. When an overlooked woman with a debilitating menstrual flow of blood 
came near to him and needed to be healed, needed to be restored back to the community of God's people. I don't think the devil ever truly left Jesus alone. In every moment of his life, in every point of decision, I imagine there was that soft, whispering voice tempting alternatives to him that would try and keep him from doing what was supposed to be done and what was true to his calling. I'm sure it was annoying. It had to be unrelenting and frustrating. And it's something that actually we too are familiar with. Because ultimately, all spiritual temptations are distractions. They're attempts to distract us from who we are as children of God and disciples of a loving Savior. I recently read a very interesting article that pointed out that human attention is actually a finite resource. And it's true. In our finite lives, there are only so many things to which we can give our attention. It's a zero-sum equation. When you pay attention to one thing, you are necessarily ignoring something else. And in addition, the world has learned that there's profit to be made from grabbing people's attentions. This happens whether through commercials at their loud volume that pull us back to the screen or those pop-up videos and ads that redirect our eyes, or the rabbit holes of the internet that can literally swallow you up until you realize that 30 minutes of your life has been wasted on a meaningless distraction. The article offered this very wise maxim. Attention is a limited resource, so pay attention to where you pay attention. During this pandemic season, we've all become a little bit stir-crazy. Am I right? We've been largely stuck in our homes. We haven't been able to socialize or see friends or get out into the world nearly enough. So this has led us to feeling distracted, somewhat antsy. So I want to suggest a remedy for this. And since this is the first Sunday of Lent, this is perhaps a Lenten season remedy. I want you to pay attention to where you pay attention. Rather than giving in to the lure of distractions, find some time each day to collect your thoughts and to regain control over your focus. Now imagine for a moment that perhaps you're in one of your favorite museums here in Pittsburgh. Maybe you're standing in the Hall of Architecture in the Art Museum or perhaps in the train room at the Science Center, or surrounded by the orchid collection in Phipps Conservatory. Now this is what's actually special about those places. Museums don't collect things so much as they collect the undivided attention of their visitors. Museums are an oasis from the noisy, chaotic confusion of the world. When we enter in, the museums allow us to see things, important things, beautiful things, and to do so without distractions. See, museums are not about their holdings, about their collections. Museums are about the moments in which we become collected, inspired, attentive for a while. If we can develop that skill, that's actually a spiritual discipline that needs to be practiced. The writer-philosopher Iris Murdoch has written that prayer is really not primarily about asking God for something. Prayer is not petition. Rather, prayer is an attention to God, which is a form of love. Now hopefully you can see how this whole train of thought holds together. Human attention is a finite resource. Amid a world of persistent, devilish distractions, you need to pay attention to where you're paying attention. You need to find moments to collect your thoughts, to focus on what is beautiful and just and good. We find time for prayer, for that giving attention to God which is a form of love. 
Because ultimately what you pay attention to shows what you value and reveals who you really are. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, the devil's offerings were attempts to distract him from what was important and distract him from who he was. The devil didn't threaten Jesus. The devil didn't try to wow him with amazing displays of demonic power. The devil likely spoke quite calmly, rationally, trying to catch Jesus in a slight moment of weakness. And this is roughly what he said. Temptation number one. Jesus, I know you're hungry, and we all need things in this life to keep us comfortable and well-fed. So use your power to get some of those material things that you need. Temptation two. Jesus, you want to motivate people to be better citizens, better workers together living and doing things that are good. So use your political power with my help to accomplish those noble goals. Temptation three. Rabbi, religion is important, but we both know it's stuck on traditions and it changes far too slowly. So I want you to do one dramatic act right now that will jumpstart all that you want to accomplish in, in inspiring and changing the temple and the church. Leap off this tower. And don't worry, the angels, I'm sure, will protect you. Now when the devil said all this, it was basically true, and at some level it was even reasonable, but it was a distraction a distraction designed to tempt Jesus to become a powerful person by the world's definitions of power instead of being the Son of God by heaven's definitions of power. You know those definitions where the weak are truly strong, the last are first, the meek inherit the earth, and a crucified rabbi from Nazareth becomes the king of kings. Real power never resides in weapons and in violence. Those are, those are tools of fearfulness and spiritual weakness that really only weaken us. Real power resides in compassion and solidarity, in nonviolent resistance. We've seen the truth of that throughout the ages, through the prophetic words of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., from Henry David Thoreau on to Rosa Parks, from John Lewis and the lunch counter sit-ins to the flower power protests against the Vietnam War, from the Guatemalan activist Ricoberta Minshu, from Daniel Berrigan in Arizona, from the Standing Rock activists, and thankfully from many, many more. Peaceful activists do not let themselves get distracted from a message that is clear that says, if you want economic justice, then you need to pay attention to where the finances are going in the world. If you want racial equity, then you need to pay attention to what is value and who is being legally protected in society at large. If you want the benefits of a sustainable and blessed environment, then you need to pay attention to how water is used or abused, how power grids are controlled or mismanaged, how air quality cares nothing about state lines or national borders, and in the process let nothing distract you from the fact that we are in this together. Jesus didn't let himself be distracted in the desert. All that the devil offered him were ultimately self-serving temptations. Feed yourself. Make yourself a leader of people with my help. Grasp equality with God. Jesus never permitted himself to be distracted away from his solidarity with us, from his role as a shepherd committed to seeking every lost sheep, from his calling to be the one who is the light of the world. This first Sunday in Lent, this Lord's Day, this season of Black History Month remembrance, 
follow this line of thought once more. All human attention is precious and yet a finite resource. That's why we need to pay attention to where we are paying attention. This day, every day, may we find moments to collect our thoughts, to focus on what is beautiful, just, and good, to find time for prayer, that attention to God which is a form of love. God doesn't want us to be distracted nor heavy burdened. God wants us to remember we are baptized and called children of God, created in God's image both individually and collectively. And nothing, nothing should ever tempt us to be anything less than that. What you pay attention to shows what you value and who you really are. So breathe. Look around. Collect your thoughts and notice what Christ would have you see. For in this we are saved. In this we are made whole. In this we are truly children of a loving Creator, now and forevermore. Thanks be to God. Amen.